if I have this, I might, you might have some words of wisdom that I would love to share with other parents and other professionals. Um, and it's, it's such an opportunity for me to be with you. You don't, um, uh, it's, I'm, I just feel so blessed to have Jane as a friend and to be with you all. And Jane knows very well my desire to do as much as I can for com uh, countries in the African continent. I've been there once. I was going to be there this spring until COVID hit. And I really look for every opportunity to be with you again. Jane is already talking about something in Kenya next year. Jane knows anytime she asks, I will do anything for her because <laughs> she's a gift too. So we have a lot of time today. And I would really like to know a little bit about you. Um, you know, I can, I can give you data and I can give you facts, but I really would like to know about you. And I'd like to know about your children a little bit so that when we have discussion and questions, I can understand a little bit more. I, do you all know each other? Have you been on this line before? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, um, Maybe you would volunteer just by raising your hand to share something about your child and yourself, like how old your child is, whatever. Would anybody be willing to do that with me? Sir? Yes? No, maybe you were just scratching your head. Mm -hmm. Naomi. Is Naomi here this, this morning? I think Celestine is hey, Celestine, I see that. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you very much, Dr. Rogers. Thank you very much, Jane and Dr. Jane and Ashley for this opportunity you give to us to, to learn more about uh, how we can help our children in the spectrum of autism. I am Celestine Kwadio. I am from Africa, West Africa, in Côte d'Ivoire. Uh, I live in Abidjan. It is in a city. It is um, the capital of our country. And my boy, my second boy, is uh, on the spectrum. He is um, nearly uh, 14 uh, years old, and uh, he is nonverbal but uh, he, he, he improved very, uh, very much since the beginning. So I, I have um, good expectation about his progression, autonom autonomization, etc. And I'm here to learn more uh, about how I can help him to be uh, independent and independent in all the field of his life. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing, Celestine. I'm glad that you started. I think, do, am I speaking um, clearly for everyone? Okay. Um, there's often this sense in the field of autism that children who do not learn to speak uh, do not learn. And that's so wrong. Um, whether or not a child can speak, ch all children learn. If we teach well, all children learn. It's really in the hands of the adults who are around that child in terms of their learning. It's not the child's responsibility to learn. They are ready to learn. It is the adult's responsibility to help that child learn to find the right ways to teach. And so if any of you are worried about whether your child's going to have the language or not and have a way to um, speak to others, and if you feel like that's the only way they can do well, that's just not true. There are many ways to communicate without speech, and children who do not speak are still able to do all of the kind of daily, daily basic activities, have work, have friends, be a contributing member of their families and their communities. Um, so thank you for starting, Celestine. I appreciate that very much. 
and I will be glad we'll, we can talk for a while and then we'll have time just to ask questions. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thanks, Celestine. Miriam, I see Miriam raising her hand. Hi, Miriam. Hello, uh, my name is Miriam. I'm a psychologist from Morocco. Um, today, Dr. Jane invited me to attend to this um, meeting and I'm so happy to be here. When, when I heard that it's Dr. Roger who's there, I'm like, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so uh, I'm so glad to be here today. Um, I'm not part of this team, but I know Dr. Jane, I know Ashley, we work together and we collaborate together. Um, so I've been trained in ESDM. I have a training in ESDM in Abu Dhabi. I've been working in France and in Morocco right now. Um, so I have a lot of ch children with autism that I work with a lot of families in Morocco um, and yeah so just to to say that I'm so happy to be here today and to enjoy listening to every single word you're saying. Oh, it's nice <laughs> to meet you Miriam. Oh, I, you. Hope, I hope you continue to train and become a trainer. I don't think we don't have any trainers in Morocco. And Not we yet. We definitely yeah. need trainers in the African continent. So. Yeah, we received um, a trainer from Canada. Um, okay. She's the one who started the training here in Morocco. And yeah, for sure, I'm so interested in completing the training. Good, that's good. We're shifting to um, telehealth training for all of the workshops that we do starting immediately. So Amazing. Um, yeah, so we are very happy to, to have you on. I think our highest priority now is to have trainers in places where we don't have them. So families yeah. don't have to wait so long or go so far or um, pay so much. And I'm glad that you're there. Thank you. Would anyone else like to share? Hi, Tanai. Tanai, is that the way to say your name? Yeah, Ruth. Uh, Ruth, unmute yourself, please. Yes. Yes. Hi, Sally. Hi, everyone. Um, as my name, I'm Ruth, and uh, I have a son who is 12 feet. He's, he turned 12, like, in July, mm -hmm. and he's non-verbal, mm -hmm. and I, I, I say pre-verbal really because I don't like, I prefer saying pre-verbal because even if he doesn't talk like I would want to, I can understand what he says, so he's communicating in oh, his great. own way, yes, at least I know he's trying to say something even if he might not voice it out, and I'm, I'm from Kenya. And I started an organization, it's called Step Up for Autism in Kenya. And we do a lot of activities and we have a small therapy center. And also I'm one of the founding members of Pan-African Congress, which we did last year with Dr. Jane. Thank you. And um, I'm here to learn and hear what you got to say. I've, I've, I know you are, you're supposed to join us in Ghana or something. Yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah, COVID happened, so I, I just want to hear. I've heard a lot about you from Jane, so the Denver model, so yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for nice all your here. advocacy. Thank you for all your advocacy and all you're doing for families across the continent. And yes, I'm sorry I couldn't thank be there you. to meet you, but someday, someday we'll meet, right? Yes. Yes. Sure. <laughs> Would anyone else like to share about their, their family, their child? Clarice, is that correct? Yes, uh, yeah, you said it quite correctly, thank you. Um, Clarice Kiru. So it's actually almost midnight over here, but. <laughs> oh no. Yeah, I've, I've gotten used to it, uh, to staying up at this time nowadays. I actually look forward to it. And um, I have, a, my eldest son is four and about three months. His name is Zane. Uh, he was diagnosed when I had gone back to Kenya to get my second born. And uh, when I first had about, or just got to get an idea about autism was when uh, I had just gone to take him to his pediatrician, and then I mentioned that at the at the time he wasn't talking, he was three at the time, 
And that was at the time our only concern. However, I'd already started noticing just a few things, um, but I didn't really know whether it was autism or not. However, most people had tried to mention that maybe it could be autism. However, when I went to see his pediatrician, pediatrician, I hope I've said it right, and uh, in Kenya, and um, she's actually the one who introduced us to the Alistair Denver model. And um, at the time, I was just about to get my second baby, so it was quite overwhelming for me. <laughs> it was very, very overwhelming for me um, just to, you know, just hear first, of, first be told that our child might have autism, and then secondly, be told that we need to go through, you know, and of course, have intervention for him. And I, I couldn't be able to take him for therapies because my husband was still in Cambodia at the time. However, she took me through the Alistair Denver model with, through the tool and also recommended us to get the book, uh, which honestly has been quite eye opening and such a lifesaver for us because it actually helped me understand that it's possible as parents to be teachers for our children. I never thought that I would be able to do that. However, I've been so fortunate because since we came here, I had adopted to become a stay at home mom. And that has actually been quite beneficial for me because now I'm able to spend time with my son. And, and um, after we went through, I, she just took me through the, a, a short training of the Alisa Denver model. But because I had time, I was able to go through your book and I love it. And when Dr. Jane said you're coming, I, I couldn't believe it because it has been quite amazing for me to just uh, try and understand uh, autism, try and uh, read stories of people who have gone through uh, the training and used parent, uh, in the parent, I mean, just being parents who are able to teach their children. And I'm very, very passionate about teaching my son. I have, I know we all really enjoy seeing our children understand things when we are able to, we are the ones teaching them. So um, to all the parents out there, I just want to say, let's keep on doing this. It's, I know it's not easy, but it has, it is so worth it. It has been so worth it for me. I know my son still has quite a long way to go. However, every small step that he makes just brings so much joy to me. And I know I'm really looking forward to the session just to hear what you have to say. You know, it's definitely different from reading the book, you know, just getting to hear information from you. I mean, it's definitely surpasses you know, any book that I would read. So thank you so much, Dr. Jane, for organizing this. It honestly means a lot. I'm really, really grateful. I'm typing you an address right now. Help, I just typed it wrong. And I'm typing it again in the chat um, because we've created a set of videos to go with the book that you're talking about, Clarice. Okay. <laughs> and um, it's a set of videos and narration and cartoons that built it for parents. And it's available worldwide. Any parent who can, you know, read and understand me can um, uh, pick this up and use it. And it's called, I just posted it in the chat line for everyone. It's called Help is in Your Hands. Oops, I still did it wrong. www.helpisinyourhands.org. And um, you'll, you'll see it. It's just a set of modules, um, 20 little, I think there are 20 little, uh, 20 little video lessons, five to 10 minutes that are focused on young children, children who are five and under and um, ways to help them particularly learn to communicate, play appropriately. Um, I, I will be building more of those, but here's a start. Um, I have to apologize. It's American moms with their children in American households. Um, and I know that that's difficult to translate often. Oh, Naomi has a little boy in her lap, I see. <laughs> but anyway, uh, www.helpisinyourhands.org um, may give you some additional ideas. And many of the techniques for developing language that are in that book for young children, it's also appropriate for older children who are not, who are not communicating much yet. Um, there are very, I mean, the ways that we learn to communicate are the same across our lives. So um, there may be some help for you. Naomi, you have a little boy in your lap. Do you want to tell us about him? Yes, I do. I have really been looking forward to today. I happen to have emailed you five years ago. I emailed you, I, 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 ha I have two sons, uh, both have autism. 
And uh, the first one was diagnosed when he was just turning two. Wow. And there was no help for me here in Kenya, absolutely none. And so I go online looking for help and I just can't get any help. And then I see something about early start Denver model and a lot of hope in it. And I see Prof. Sammy Rogers and I think, I think Gerald Dawson. So I look for the email, I just Googled uh, Prof. Sammy Rogers email address. <laughs> yeah. And I emailed you and told you my story. And I said, I just need help. I've seen there's something on early start Denver model. My son is two, I don't know what to do. And then you e you emailed back after two months. Oh, <laughs> so no, you I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh. That was, that, that was your office line. It was your office line. <laughs> it was your office line and uh, you told me you had been in Africa. And so you couldn't see the email. So you, you emailed me back. Then you told me you're sending me the book. And I received the book when he was just about to turn two. Because he was diagnosed a few months to turn into. My son who couldn't even look at me, that's my first one. He had stopped looking at us. He had stopped, he was in his own world. Within a very short time, he started looking at us again. Within a very short time, he started working on his communication skills, a lot of other skills. And to be honest, it was such a help for me as a person, bearing in mind that a diagnosis with no help is so frustrating. <laughs> So I was so helped. I mean, by the time I got my second son and he was also diagnosed with autism, I was in a much better place. You actually sent me a copy of your book immediately, and it's what I've been using uh, with my boys, both of them. And I've helped at least two or three other parents, three actually, three other parents with the same book, and they have been greatly helped. That's why I was really, really looking forward to today's meeting. I just really wanted to get to see you, know you, and say thank you so much. You. The little boy you met is my younger son. I was in class and he just felt his mistakes in my mind. He came this way. My first son is nonverbal still, but he does communicate. And uh, he, we have so much of his attention. Good. And it began when I started using the Alice at Denver model. So that's why for me, it's a story of help came from somewhere. And it was from you, actually. So thank you so much. You're thank welcome. you so much. You're very welcome, Naomi. I remember sending you the book. I didn't remember your name, but I do remember. Yes, you did. I do remember wow. finding, buying a book on Amazon because I didn't have any more. <laughs> and then going to the post office and sending it to you. I'm so glad it got to you. <laughs> and I'm so glad it helped. Um, it then, did, it got to me and it really helped me. I'm glad. Feel free to, to photocopy any pages yeah. you want and send it to, uh, you share it with other families. I know that that's yes, usually not, you know, that's not usually what we say to do, but and for African families trying to get help, absolutely. And this website um, may be helpful for you as well and your boys. Um, pa parents have liked that website very, very much. And actually, I'll tell you, we did a little study. Um, one of my very, really smart postdocs had an idea of just giving this, the site to a set of families and then asking them to send videos in return for, ha uh, send videos of them working with their children in return for getting access to the videos. So they had to send a video before we started, just five minutes of play, and then we sent them like one module, four videos. And then they, when they had done those, then they sent us another video, five minutes of play, we sent them four more videos. So over the time, we got samples of the parents' play as they were watching the videos. And the changes in those parents on the tools that we use for looking at how parents interact with their children to help them learn. It was amazing. No therapist, nobody, just these videos, no text, just the videos. And we saw this very nice learning curve as parents uh, just learned to, to uh, embed these different techniques into everyday life. It's not therapy, it's just living with children and how you talk to them how you interact with them, 
how you do what you do when you feed them and dress them and play with them and take them to the store. And um, what else do we do with children? Go outside and read books. It's just these simple little techniques that are so easy to embed in daily life. And it was really, it was, you know, for me looking at the results of that little study, it just, I mean, it just showed what I already know about parents that you're so motivated to help your children. We all are, I'm a parent too. And that um, the things aren't so hard. People make autism sound like this incredibly difficult disorder and that it's so hard to teach them and you have to do so many special things and pay all this money and spend all this time. And you know, it's really not like that. I mean, parents and family life is as good a classroom as anything, better classrooms than many, most maybe, and it's just as good a way to, for children to learn as any other way. I mean, before children go to school, look how much your babies learn at home with you from the time they're born until they're four years old. It's a miracle what a four-year-old child can do. And that's all because of all of you. It's what you do at home every day, you, your family, daily life. That is how children learn. The problem uh, for children with autism is that it's hard to tune into that. The learning environment is there, but the child's ability to tune in to what you're doing, that's affected by autism. And so um, what we have to do is, I always think of we have to help, it, we have to turn up the volume. I always think about turning up the volume on a, audio or on your computer. We have to turn up the volume, not of our voices, but of our signals. We have to help the message get in, get in through the eyes, get in through the ears, get into an attentive child. And if they are attending and we are giving them an opportunity to respond, they will get the message. But it's that tuning in that's so hard. And in the first um, couple of years, you know, when a young child with autism is developing their symptoms as a one-year-old or a two-year-old, they're not yet tuned into very much else in their world either. I think of them as kind of in limbo as they're trying to figure out what's going on. Um, but after two or three, they figure out a lot about what's going on, but they figure out about the physical world. They're not figuring out language very well. They're not figuring out the social world very well, but they're figuring out other things. They figure out what they like. They figure out what means what to them. They figure out how to get what they want. And so they start to develop another way of being in the world, tuning into different cues, uh, finding their interests and pleasure in different activities than the family and social interaction. And so for older children, they're, they've already got a whole agenda of their own. And it's, and they have another way of think, thinking and of reacting to the world. And so our intervention techniques are different for older children who already have a lot of knowledge about their own world. Um, we have to introduce them in a different way. But for a very young child, they, I think of them kind of as in limbo, really, that they're ready to learn. They haven't figured out a lot of anything about the world. And so they're still able to learn the way babies learn if we can get the message in, in the way that we teach babies. And so that's why the Early Start Denver model really focuses on these young children and on using, on kind of activating their developmental skills which are like other babies and other toddlers but they haven't kind of been wakened up yet or turned on. Um, older children learn very well through all kinds of educational techniques. They learn according to the same principles as other children do but they already have their own agenda and their own way of thinking and being and so we come we join them, we don't reject what they've learned and what they like. We join them in trying to increase their skills and increase their abilities using what they already have. 
And that's kind of why my work, the young, when my work with young children, I use different, some different concepts and some different tools and different ways of being with them than I would be working with a five-year-old or an eight-year-old or a 14-year-old like Celestine's boy. Um, those are children who can still learn, who are still interested in people, who still want to interact and be with us. But it's, you know, a 14-year-old is a different person than a three-year-old, whether they have autism or not. And we have to um, meet each child where they are, what they want to do, what they like, what they know about us, what pleases them. And just as with any other child, that's our vehicle for teaching, learning, and um, kind of helping them contribute, be part of the family, contribute to the family, contribute to the community. Each person in the world has their own agenda, right? All of us have our own talents. We all have our own interests. We all have things that turn us on and we have things that turn us off. And uh, a good teacher will work with us, each of us, as we are. Um, anyway, so I'm happy to, I'm trying to figure out how many of you actually have young children. You know, I think ESDM is really about young children. And if many of you on the, on the screen have young children, we could talk more formally about Early Start Denver model. If most of you have children who are six to, to 15 or so, it may make more sense to talk about other ways of teaching children. Jane, I need your help here. What would you like me to do? Okay. Uh, how, how many actually have young children? I think it's only Naomi and Clarice and Shalon. Yeah. So let's talk about um, Alistair Denver model. Okay, we'll start there. And um, let's see, we have a long time, right? We have an hour and a half still. So why don't we start with young children, and then we'll stop about young children, and then we'll shift to older children. How's that? So everybody can have a chance to hopefully get something useful out of our time together. All right, I have a, a talk here that I will kind of base things on. I'll talk from it. I'm going to share my screen. And... All righty, where am I? Okay. I'll take you through the basic parts of Early Start Denver model. Uh, and if you have a question, I wonder if I can follow chat. Um, Jane, can you follow the chat while I'm doing this? Yes, I'll follow the chat. Okay, so if you have a question about anything I'm saying or anything I'm showing, please put it in a chat right then and there. And Jane, please interrupt me right then so that we can answer questions and, and be clear about what um, kind of what I'm sharing. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about what is the Early Start Denver model how we think it works, why we think it works, how we do it, and what some of the scientific evidence, the research evidence is that shows us that in general, this is a good treatment. And I wanna start out by saying that there are many interventions that have similar properties. Um, there's a whole category now of interventions called the naturalistic developmental behavioral interventions, NDBI. Jane, would you put that in a chat for everybody right now? NDBI, Naturalistic Developmental Behavioral Interventions. And ESDM is one of them. I think we're probably the first intervention that coined that term, that brought together developmental science and behavioral science into one intervention. But there are several other well-researched techniques, uh, NDBIs, out in the field that also have good efficacy data that focus on parent training and that are available through websites and other kinds of um, learning tools for parents. 
So when you're looking for information, in addition to um, searching under ESDM, feel free to, sh to look under NDBI because you'll find interventions like the CERTS model, S-C-E-R-T-S. Um, so this is not the only one. All right. So when I start, I'm an old lady, I'm a grandma. Um, I'm old enough to be Jane's mama. <laughs> and when I started in this field, the idea about autism and the data that we had from autism said that this is a very severe disorder. It caused great levels of disability and that it was untreatable. And the information that we had at the time said that children with autism also had intellectual disability or mental retardation. I don't know which term you know the best. That the majority of them would never speak they would never be able to learn to read or write. And in my country, the recommendation was to put them in institutions and to let them, uh, and to go on with your life as a family because there was nothing to do. And even as late as the end of the last century, the data that we had that followed children over time in the, in the United States, where early intervention was already available, still showed this. It still gave this idea. Here, are this is IQ data from two different studies, very high quality studies. I'm sorry, my pointer doesn't work. And I don't quite know how to point online, so I'll just describe. Um, these, these studies were both done by friends of mine. On the left, Dr. Catherine Lord, I bet you know her name. She's the one who developed our diagnostic systems. She studied a group of children in the United States from age two to age nine. And she compared children with autism who are shown in the blue line on the left to children who had been diagnosed with intellectual disability who are in green. And these are IQ scores that you see. And you see that the children on the left in blue, this is a large group of children, 84 children with autism at age two. Their mean IQ was about 45 when they were two, and their mean IQ was about 47 when they were nine. So this is a pretty significant level of impairment for a child with intellectual disability. Um, the children she was comparing to who were in green who had intellectual disability also show very stable rates of change. So even with special education, there was no real gain in children's IQs, which reflects their, their learning rates at the time, about half the learning rate of a child their age. The study on the right confirms these kind of, it replicates this kind of data children um, examined in California from age two to age 12. Again, the children with autism show significant moderate, on um, average, moderate levels of intellectual disability that did not change over time, similar to children with intellectual disability. And these are all American children getting early intervention and getting ed education all through school, full day of education. So this was what the field thought when I started my work in autism. And Dr. Ivar Lovas's paper in 1987 showed very, very different pattern. Here, the children in blue are the children who received his treatment, uh, starting at about age two and a half, and receiving four or five years of discrete trial training, uh, lots of it, 40 hours, 30 to 40 hours a week over time until they were seven or eight. So the children in blue got his treatment and the children in yellow also got some of that treatment, but not very much, less than 10 hours a week. And you can see that the children who got very little intervention made very little progress. They gained some IQ points, they improved their learning rates a little bit, not very much. But the children who got intensive intervention early 
improved their learning rates so much that they were basically no longer, they did not have intellectual disability. They did not have mental retardation. Their IQ scores were in the normal range. So this was published in 1987. And most of the American researchers, they just didn't believe it. They just disregarded this paper. They wrote, man, there are many editorials that were written in the journal that published it saying, this isn't possible. There's something funny about the way they did the research. It wasn't a randomized trial. He handpicked the patients. There was lots and lots of that. No one believed this, that this was possible. But I was young. I was doing early intervention. I already understood that starting very early and providing the kinds of developmentally cued in interventions that I do made changes rapidly in children's learning rate. And so I took this on as a challenge. It's like, okay, if this can happen, I'm gonna figure out how to do it. And this is what motivated me um, in 1987. I'd been doing early intervention. I'd been running studies and interventions for about five years for young children with autism. And I took this as a sign, all right, this is what's possible, I'm gonna learn how to do it. And that's what's motivated me for the, for the rest of my life in the work that I do. Um, but Ivar Lovas was a behaviorist. He, he didn't know much about developmental science and much of the developmental science that really helps us teach children with autism was not even in press at the time he was doing this work. There's a huge, huge change in our understanding of how young children learn to speak and how to learn to relate to other people and where speech comes from. And that research went on across, beginning in about 1981 or 82. So this science was occurring after Ivar Lovas had developed his techniques and his way of teaching children. But I was in this period of science and I was watching this science grow. I was in labs that were studying it. So I had the opportunity to really learn the new science about how babies develop speech. And one of the things that was very clear from the new science, which Ivar didn't have access to at the time, is that babies look, that speech is kind of, I think of it a very late development in communicate, what babies know about communication. And before a baby ever utters their first word, they are already very skilled communicators using their bodies and using body language. And I have this little granddaughter right now who's about 16 months old. I just spent a week with her. And before she could say her first word, I was watching her, I spend a lot of time with her. And I was just amazed at all the things a baby can tell you before they ever speak. They tell you what they want. They tell you what they don't want. They tell you what they want you to do, like pick them up or feed me or put me down or give me that toy or let me run around on the floor or get me out of this high chair, get me out of this cart. They tell you what they want you to look at. They'll point up to the sky or outside when they see something and they use that little finger and it's like, look at that mom, look at that dad. T you know, tell me what that is. And it's all about that finger. That finger and this hand, no, and this hand that says up and this face that tells you, I like that, I don't want that, I'm sad, I'm scared. They tell us all the things that are important to them before they ever say their first word. And they also read us that way. Before they understand our words, they read our faces, they read our bodies, they look at what's going on around them, among the people, and they make very good guesses about what's going on, about those, what those people are thinking and what those people are feeling. And so it's this understanding of how 
humans communicate without words. That's what helps kids learn to talk. If you don't understand this body language, then learning about speech is a very, very difficult proposition. And coming at it by labeling pictures and picking up pictures is a very, very difficult way to enter the world of language and communication. And so we started out doing our treatment based on this model of communication that kids need to learn about body language, about nonverbal communication. They need to learn about what other people are doing with it and they learn, need to learn how to use it. And if they learn how powerful their body is in communicating, then speech has a big leg up because it's kind of like, I often use the idea of a Christmas tree, that the branches of, the, or any tree, the tree itself, the branches of the tree are the structure. And it's like nonverbal communication, all those things we communicate without speech, that's the communicative structure of human interaction. And when you get to the point of a word, it's kind of like an ornament hung on the Christmas tree. It's beautiful, it's very effective, it captures attention, it's an easier way to communicate than gesture is. And that's why kids eventually go from their very skilled body language into speech, because speech is easier. It's more powerful, you can say more things with speech, and um, you don't have to be looking at people to talk to them. So eventually speech replaces body language to some extent. Although, as you all know, we all use body language to communicate with our speech. I mean, to talk, here I am, I'm using my hands constantly with you, I'm using my face with you. I could also talk with you like this without any nonverbal communication at all, but I can't really communicate my message nearly as well as I can when I turn on my face and I use my hands. So that's where speech comes from. And that's where play comes from. And that's where learning to want to please your mama by feeding yourself or using the toilet um, or playing with your sister. That's where little kids become socialized. It's in that social realm. And young children with autism have that. So, um, Let's talk about social motivation for a minute, because um, in the days of Ivar Lovas, there were a couple of mistakes that were made. We didn't understand autism at that time. At that time, we thought, A, kids with autism couldn't learn in the typical way, that they had to be taught in this very rigid and rote way of teaching because they could not access this other route, this route through communication, social motivation. And people thought that because they thought kids with autism didn't care about people. They didn't care about pleasing people. They weren't inclined to be part of the social world, um, that we had to reward them for doing that. We had to kind of pay them off for doing, for doing all these things because the natural rewards that children work on, which is being part of the group, which is having your mama and your dad happy with you, which is having your siblings have fun with you, all that pleasure that little children get from the social world, that's what motivates them to become like everybody else. People thought incorrectly that children with autism didn't have that. So that was one mistake, they didn't have that. Second, they thought they couldn't learn the, through these roots. That was the second mistake. And the third mistake was that they had a very differently wired brain, a brain that would not allow them to hold multiple stimuli in their minds at once, a brain that wouldn't allow them to generalize what they were learning from home into other situations, a brain that required this very different way of teaching in order to learn. And um, over the last 30 years of science, it's been what we've learned now is that all those things are not true. We know that children with autism 
do enjoy social interaction, that they do enjoy the back and forth with the people that they love. We know that they love other people. We know that they're attached to their mothers and their fathers and their grandmothers and their grandfathers and their siblings, that they feel safe with them, that they want to be with them. We know that they can learn in the way that typically developing children learn early in life. Um, and we learn that they're, the way that they think is not so different and the way that they learn is not so different from every other child. What we've learned is that the problem, the core problem is what I talked with you about a minute ago. And we're gonna come back to that in a second. So um, the intervention, the early start intervention is tailored to young children with autism in a couple of ways. First of all, it uses developmental and behavior science. Second, in the ways that children with autism are different from typically developing children, um, this is the term ASD neuropsychology specific. ESDM is specific to the differences that young children with autism bring to a learning situation, and we, tar we uh, target those. The third thing about Early Start Denver model and about any other good autism intervention is that we understand that autism affects all areas of a child's life. It affects their learning. It affects their communication. It even affects their motor development. The differences in brain function that affect autism are related to clumsiness, poor muscle tone. It's not just a communication disorder. Most children with autism early on have del some delays in motor development, some delays in fine motor development. Um, those translate into difficulties in uh, coordinated hand movements um, and in many other, and dressing skills. Um, they're clumsy. Many of them are clumsy and we need to take that into account. And so Early Start Denver model focuses on every area of development, of early development. Um, and that makes, maybe makes it sound so comp more complicated, like, well, you mean I have to learn how to be a motor therapist and an OT and a speech therapist and a parent? It's like, no, not really, because little children, anything we do with them, it involves their bodies, that's gross motor development. It involves their hands, that's fine motor development. It involves communicating and understanding that speech and language and nonverbal communication. It involves either daily life activities or play. And those are two developmental domains, but like it's all in one. Little children, anything we do with them in a naturalistic way involves all of the developmental domains. That's why little children grow up so competently in your household. So ESDM is built on that, the idea that we don't just teach one thing, like sit at a table and teach a child to poke their finger to isolate this. I mean, that's, that's only, that's a, a kind of a, I mean, it's just that you can do so much more when you're talking about poking. Put a puzzle in front of them with holes, give them pins to go in the holes, then talk about the pin goes in the hole. See, poke, poke, poke. Here's the pin, put it in. Here's a red pin, put that one in. Here's the green pin, put that one in. Let's put them, let's take them all out. Let's put them in the basket. Let's dump them out. Let's put them back in. So now we're talking about poking and we're talking about playing a game and we're talking about colors and we're talking about in and out and we're following instructions. That's a rich way to teach. We're still poking, we're still isolating that finger, but we've also taught about 10 other things at the same time. And it makes it much more fun for the child. They're highly motivated by the activity. We don't have to reinforce them with tokens or food or anything else because the activity itself is enjoyable. So that's what I mean about a comprehensive intervention. We address all of the areas of development and we do it within each activity. It's an activity-based model, not a skill-based model. 
Um, and as you can hear, we're talking about natural learning activities that happen in everyday life. Um, a couple other things about Early Start Denver model before we leave is that it's probably, I think right now, the best researched intervention out there. We just put a new paper up. I don't know if you've seen it, Jane. It went up on the 24th, the comparative study. Yes. Um, gosh, I didn't even know it was up. And then I got an email from a student saying, oh, this paper is up. Please send me a copy. It's like, I didn't know that paper was up yet. So there are currently over 25 studies of ESDM, and at least 15 to 20 of those are either randomized controlled trials or well-controlled trials. Um, we have meta-analyses, all of controlled trials that demonstrate good effects. Anyway, it's a well-researched intervention right now. It's got manuals for everything that goes with it. And it's also a very flexible model. Parents can do it, anybody can do this model. There's nothing so special about it. You don't need degrees to use these techniques. Parents can learn, parents can learn the techniques of ESDM in eight hours. In eight hours of intervention, of coaching with another therapist, parents perform these skills at the level of a trained therapist. That's not magic. That's just great parenting skills tuned up a little bit to fit the needs of a specific child, which are puzzling for parents because we don't come into the world knowing how to do autism parenting. We come into the world knowing how to do typical parenting. And some of the things that we do to fine tune for autism doesn't really fit a natural way of parenting. It's a little intrusive. So we have to tune up a little bit. So that's what Early Start Denver model is all about. The theory underlying it is about what we think about what's wrong in autism. Why does it play out the way it plays out? And at this point, there's good, everybody doesn't buy this model. This is the social motivation model of autism or the social orienting model of autism. Um, there is plenty of research evidence for it. It's not universally um, embraced yet, although I don't think anyone denies that there is a problem with social orienting or social motivation. Um, I think the challenge is, uh, the arguments are like, what's the core of that? What's the core of that? So we, uh, those of us who, who accept this model believe that the core of this is a brain wiring problem. The, not an imp, impairment, but a difference. And again, I'm thinking about the volume. The idea here is that the biology of autism has to do with what uh, stimuli in the world are attractive, are most attractive for babies and little children. And as you all know, because you're all parents, most children, uh, by the time they're about three months old, and up until I would say at least two to three, are more interested in people than anything else around them. That if people are in the room, if somebody is interacting with a baby, they tune into that person like it's a magnet. And that person is much more interesting to them than anything else in the room. They will turn away from the lights, turn away from the sounds, turn away from their toy, and beam into the face of the person who's talking. And as soon as they can figure out how to get your attention by four or five months, as soon as they know their voice will grab you, or their eye contact will grab you, or something cute that they do, they shake their toy and we all look at them because we hear the noise. As soon as they learn, they can capture our attention. That's like all they wanna do. You can't, you can't, they're experts in getting our attention, right? Try to talk on your cell phone with your toddler in the room and try to get that, you know, try to get that toddler to let you talk. And then their expertise in getting parent attention comes out. Try to do something like cook at the stove or fold laundry or whatever it is you're trying to do with a toddler running around and tell me how hard it is 
to be able to finish that five minute task without your toddler interrupting you. Unless there's somebody else for them to play with, they want your attention. And they have a hundred ways. If they can't get it by being nice, they'll go over and dump something or do something that they know you'll say no, no, no to. They'll do something naughty to get your attention if they can't get it any other way because they know so many tricks for getting your attention. It's that important to them. Well, the thing is that for, for babies and little kids who are just developing autism, they're not so interested in people. And we know this by um, looking at having babies look at videos in which there's a person in a setting where there's also an interesting object. We can set up a picture of a person talking and a picture of a little train running around. And we can look and see where the baby looks the most. Or they can look at a video of a couple of kids playing on a playground where there's also a swing moving and a squirrel walking around and maybe a car horn going off. And we can look at where typically developing babies look and where children with autism look. And what we know is that children with autism uh, are more interested in the non-social stuff that's going on on these screens than they are at the social stuff. Whereas babies who don't have, aren't going to develop autism, don't have autism in the family, they're riveted by the social stimuli and they'll spend much more time looking at the social stimuli than they will these other interesting things that are going on. And so the way we think about this is that the brain in a child's mind, I think of it, I think of it this way, the volume of the social stimuli is kind of turned down a little bit and the volume of non-social things that are going on is turned up a little bit. And so people are competing we have to compete with the rest of the world for a young child's attention in a way that we don't for other children. Um, now, so that's the basic model. That's the basic biological model that we are thinking about in autism. And if we don't compete well with the rest of the world, if we can't figure out how to get in there, then over time, that toddler with autism is going to spend less and less time attending to what's going on around them, less and less time listening to speech because it's not so interesting to them. And more and more time spending their time, you know, twiddling the things they love, um, you know, the block, running around with the blocks that they want to hold or watching the fans on the ceiling or um, what do they want to carry around? Whatever their favorite things are, they want to carry them around, look at them, look at their fingers, um, flip things around, flip strings, and there's no learning value in the things they're doing. Not, there's no social learning for them. So they're really losing out in the most important years there are. They're, they're really losing out. And a baby's mind is very plastic. You know that. The babies, we, we don't really come into the world with a fully formed brain. We come into the world with a brain that is very plastic ready to learn whatever the environment is ready to teach. And that's the, the beauty of human evolution and of how brains are created. The brain is, a baby's brain is ready to learn whatever it is they're paying attention to because that's gonna prepare them the best for their environment. Well, unfortunately, a child with autism is not drawn to things that contain the most important information for them. And so the more time they spend learning about the physical world, about strings and fans and sounds and spinning wheels and trains and whatever else, their brain is becoming very, very expert in that. But it's not becoming expert in language and in social communication. And we also know that about in the later part of preschool period, the brain starts to weed itself out. If the brain held on to every connection it ever made, it gets too messy and it becomes very inefficient. So just like we have to clean our computer files out sometime or our computers slow down, the brain cleans out um, um, neuronal connections that aren't being used. It cleans it out to make a faster system. And so 
and that's called pruning, neural pruning. It happens throughout life, but it happens particularly later preschool years. And so if that brain has not developed these active networks about social communication, social attention, social interaction, if its expertise is in sounds and lights and how you make things work, mechanical things, those are the connections that are gonna get maintained. And the connections that are um, kind of about people which have not built, been built up very much and not used very much, those are likely to get pruned away. And then we have a different kind of a brain, a brain that can still learn communication, can still learn tons of things, but is not so skilled anymore or so fast at learning about people stuff. And that is what ends up limiting the range of skills children with autism can learn. So that's how I understand autism. And that's what makes me value everyday activities, interactions that go on constantly in a household, because that's how little kids learn. Um, so things that we'll go, we've, we'll talk about these things later. Um, so now I want to I want to show you a video in which a therapist is working. Uh, this is their like their. Second time this therapist has ever met this little girl. This little girl's two years old. She's just turned two. She has very significant autism. And she has the kind of autism, you know, autism is different from child to child. This child's autism, she's a very passive child. She's very low energy. She spends a lot of time just lying on the floor, playing with her spit or kind of looking around the room or playing with the whatever is on the floor, the rug or the carpeting or the wood or the tile, the, the grout and the tile. She's not interested in much. She doesn't do much. Her parents say she doesn't, she doesn't talk. She doesn't eat. She's still being completely breastfed. She doesn't play with toys. She doesn't handle things. She's very, when you touch her, I had the chance to interact with her. Her, her muscles feel limp and her mom picks her up and she just kind of lies on her mom like a rag doll. So she's a very effective little girl. And we know, I know this child from age two to age six. And she was in our studies. We assessed her every year Every single year, she continues to have autism. So this is a child with autism. But I'm going to show you the video and talk with you a little bit about what's going on. So you can see how the therapist uses the skills that a parent would in playing with a child, but intensifies it a little bit to capture this child's attention. And the first thing you're going to see her do is to create a situation in which the, the rest of the room does not compete for the child's attention. Um, the therapist manages to have herself always the primary thing in the child's attention. So I want you to see how she does this, how she captures child attention, because that's the beginning point of learning. No attention, no learning. Okay, so here we go. What are you doing? You got to up here. So she's trying to figure out what the child wants to do. What's going to capture this old girl's attention? She thinks it's these blocks. Because that's what the child was looking at. But as you can see, the minute she took it away, the child stopped paying attention. So the therapist is going to give up on this and find another way to capture this little girl's attention. I'll move ahead a little bit. So she goes over again to see what she's doing now. And she's doing a drum. Let me stop this a second. So this time the therapist doesn't move. She picks up a second drum. She 
moves the drums around in a way that the little girl's back is now to all those toys. And she sits down against that bare wall. So in order for the little girl to see the drums, there's nothing else to see except this grown up. She's done a very good job of just turning away from all the interesting toys that are in that toy chest and using that bare wall as a backdrop. Okay, so she has the same toy the child wanted. She now has nothing to distract the child other than these toys. And she's going to start doing something very interesting with this drum. Okay, so right away, she has, she's starting to teach. The minute she started to use that drum, she's starting to teach. And it's because she's not just banging, which isn't necessarily teaching anything, although the little girl started to imitate her. And imitation is a profoundly powerful way for kids to learn. But she's not just banging, she's also stopping. And she's using the word stop. So she, now she's creating both a motor imitation, there's the motor skill. She's doing two different things with that wand. So the little girl has to not only bang, but also has to stop banging. That's two different motions. And she's also using the matching words, go and stop, bang and stop. So she's putting the words to the actions and the child understands the actions because we've just seen her do it. So by pairing the word with the action the child knows, now the words take on meaning. So all she really was hoping for was that the child would look. She's just trying to get eye contact. But oh my gosh, here's a little miracle. This child speaks in three times of hearing that word go and seeing what would happen, what go means. That little girl said go. The child whose parents had never heard her say a word says it in less than two minutes of treatment because of the way the therapist has set this up. The word go is so powerful here. And the therapist waited. And now we see that the little girl really likes to see the therapist bang. The child could be banging anyway, but she doesn't. She uses go to turn the therapist on. There's the social motivation. It's not just about the drums. It's about this person who's imitating her and doing something important. And there's a second very important uh, lesson for parents. P when you imitate your child with autism, that's interesting to kids. Kids like to be imitated. And that's the root in that this therapist is using. It isn't just the drum that's a powerful attention getter. It's imitating the child. And this little girl has just shown us that that's true. So now let's see what the therapist does with this.
Okay, let's talk about what's going on here. You can see she's introduced two new concepts, fast and slow. She's still doing it with the drum. I mean, there aren't that many things you can do with the drum, right? And we know the little girl likes the drumming. So fast and slow is, is tapping what this child's very interested in. And it's dramatic. She's creating a dramatic effect here, not just with the drum, but also with her face and her voice. Um, and this little girl, it, this is so exciting for the child. We see her get all revved up. She's all excited. She's smiling. She's laughing. And she's using the words fast and slow. She's learned it just like that because it goes with the action. And let's talk a minute about arousal. Um, is it a good thing or a bad thing that this child is so excited? Well, the only way we can tell is, does it help learning or does it hurt learning? If it's getting in the way of learning, then a child, we wanna calm them down. But we see with this little girl, who I told you is a pretty low energy child, it's clearly helping learning. This little girl learns faster when she's more revved up and the therapist has just figured that out. There's another point I want, I want you to see right here. You know how in the beginning, the adult was giving kind of all the models. She started, she stopped, she went past, she went slow. The little girl is now directing the adult. She's the one that said slow. When the adult reached over to her drum, she's the one that pushed the adult back to her own drum. And the child said slow. So now the little girl has a tool for controlling the adult, and now they can go back and forth like social partners. The child can lead and the adult can follow, and the adult can lead and the child can follow. And this is something we really seek in ESDM, that the child and the adult are both active initiators and followers. Why is that so important? because that's what conversation's all about. That's how we interact with anybody. Um, if all I do is initiate with you, you're gonna get pretty tired of being a listener. And if all you do is talk to me and never give me a chance to talk to you, I'm gonna get pretty tired. A good conversation, each person adds something to the conversation that goes back and forth and back and forth. And young children know that it's not about speech. It's about how human beings share information back and forth. And this has now occurred. We're at minute three and a half, and now the child has a way of directing the adult. Why? Because they have developed a common vocabulary. They now have shared meaning. They both have some ways to talk about what's going on with this drum. And it's through their actions and their words. And even if this little girl couldn't produce the words, she still got the actions, the nonverbal communication to be doing this. And she's shown us that. She stopped the adult nonverbally. She's starting with her body demonstrating the tempo. So now we have a social interaction that has two active partners. I call that a balanced interaction. And that is a really critical part of what we're see see seeking in this intervention because that makes social interaction pleasurable. And you see how much this child likes controlling the adult. Okay, I'm gonna move it a little bit farther. Let's see, the adult does something here. She stops the game. Oh no. The little girl says, oh no. 
Here's a giant initiation. Thanks, Karina. Now what? No. Okay, child's completely leading this. You take this, you hold this, you do this. New idea. Let's talk about what's going on here. Why is the adult doing up and down right now? Because banging is getting boring. There, there's nothing new to be learned from what's already happened. The, little, the child's mastered it. And repetition in and of itself doesn't teach anything new. We want, we've got beautiful attention here. We want to keep doing new things. We're teaching in this interaction. So she introduces what I call a variation in the game. She still has this materials, which the child loves, but now they do something different. She introduces two new words, up and down. And they're still motoric words. You can still do them with this tool, but they're new concepts. And as you see this little girl struggle to hold this thing up high, this is a gross motor challenge for her. It's a balance challenge for her. It's a body planning challenge for her, as well as a new word and a new concept and a new gesture. And so now it's up and down. And the, we see the adult take three turns in a row to teach it. She taught it up, then she taught down, then she taught up again. And now we're gonna see the little girl start to lead. Now she's got something new to talk about. See how hard this is for her. There's a weight. Down. Down low, the child said. Down low. I hope you appreciate these long pauses the therapist is using. She, um, she takes several turns to teach something new, but then she waits, she stops, and gives the child a chance to become the initiator. And so she's throwing the game back to the little girl so the little girl can be an active participant and an active director. And those pauses are very effective because the child is read as expecting something to happen. The adult has set up these rhythms. And so when she violates them, and creates this silence, the little girl steps in to fill it in. These pauses are very powerful, but they're powerful because of the routine that's been established, which the adult is now violating a little bit. And the child shows, I know how this game goes, and she steps in to fill the void. The adult does never say, she never says, tell me, talk to me, say up, say down, she never cues the child to speak or to initiate in any way. She gives the child the chance and the child takes it because the game is well established and because the child likes the game. Hi. All right, let's move a little bit here. Eventually, you know, we do want to do something different. So here comes another variation. Here's, Here's peekaboo. There's the imitation. There she is. Peekaboo. Social game. There's the imitation. Here I am. 
So that's another variation with another teaching point to it. And now the child, it's her turn and she takes it back to the banging. But the therapist is running out of ideas here. There's just only so much you can do with a drum. And I want you to see how she changes things without losing the child's ability to have something, kind of some control over the situation. She doesn't just say, all done, time for something else, because she's got great attention here. And if she stops it and takes the drum away, the child's liable to have a fit or want to do something else or cry or leave or check out. She's going to do a transition much more skillfully. This is part of ESDM as well. Let me see if I can find the place where the transition occurs here. Oh, here's another game. That's going to be a tickle game. Another variation. Waiting for an invite. Do you want it some more? She doesn't. That was a nicely done. Tickling can be intrusive, so she's really being careful with it. More. She introduced a new word, more, more drum. Another concept. Slow, little girl initiates. She's got that word down, both her body and her voice. Something else interesting. Not interesting enough though. Aha, now it's interesting. Okay, so in the next minute, that little girl has the xylophone, she slips the drums away, and the xylophone becomes the next activity with different language and different learning goals. Okay, so. That, I'm gonna go back for a minute. That, that is a very good example of the basic principles of the ESDM. So let's go through them a minute. First of all, it's a typical activity. Second, the child wants to do this. The child has inherent interest in this activity, um, which the adult didn't create. She just looked for something and it could be anything. Third, the language and the, uh, skills that the adult is using are already in the child's repertoire. This little girl doesn't speak yet, we think, so the adult is using single words. The child demonstrates that she knows something about a drum and a hammer, and so the adult bangs the way the child does. So we're meeting the child where she is. She can fully participate. She's already a master at this. So, so she's on familiar territory, you know? She can, she can take pleasure in acting on something that she likes. Um, what's another principle? The adult takes very brief turns uh, before she hands it over to the child. Um, I, we've already talked about this idea of balanced interactions. The adult is both a, direct, a leader and a follower and she finds ways so that the child has a chance to lead and it's in those pauses. She finds ways to follow the child. She makes sure that when the child says something to do, the adult does it because we want the child to feel the power of words. And if this child couldn't speak, the adult would be imitating what the child does with the drum to, to say, I get your nonverbal message, I'm with you. Because of this, they're creating a shared meaning. They both understand what is happening and they understand this nonverbal language of fast and slow, up and down, loud and soft. Um, what else? I don't know what else. Anyway, this idea of share, creating shared meanings inside the game. And all this repetition is building up the shared meaning. We know the child has it when we see her respond. Other principles are this theme and variation, that we, still, we start with a theme, the theme the child understands first, and we put a name to it, banging, um, whatever it is, some verbal theme, it's usually an action for little ones. And then after that's well established, the adult starts to add variations because there's nothing more to be gained. Once the theme is mastered, we've got to do something new in order to keep learning. So then the adult in, involves theme and variations. Um, and that's, um, so that's 
two of the four steps of, of a joint learning activity. This whole thing, I told you we, we teach based in activities. Here is an activity. This drumming is a whole activity. And it has four steps. We always talk about a four step learning activity. There's the setup, the theme, the variations, and the closing or transition. So the setup is everything that happens before the theme emerges. In this activity, the first theme is banging on the drum, bang, bang, bang. The setup is all the stuff that happened before that banging started, trying to find the right toy, trying to get them both positioned correctly, trying to get face to face in front of the child and manage all the distractions. Having these two things going on so the child can imitate. That's all the setup. And once the adult drums, she's introducing a possible theme, but it's not a theme until it's the child's theme. So once the child starts to drum, now we have a theme. So they go back and forth, sharing control, balanced interactions around drumming until we know that's established and then it's time to bring in new learning and it becomes fast and slow. And that's the first new learning idea. And then after that gets established and it's fun and so we have drumming and we have fast and slow, then she needs another variation. So it becomes high and low or up and down and that involves new movements up and down on the floor, uh, new actions as well as new words. And so she tries to then, she tries to create some other games with these tools, the peekaboo game, the tickle game. They didn't work. The child never picked those up as a theme. So those are kind of failed efforts at new variations. She's doing it exactly right. You never know what will take and what won't. And when she finally feels like I've got nothing else to teach here, I need to move to something new, new material, new ideas. She, she ends this game, so she stops it. That's the fourth step. It's, it's the ending and the transition. She ends the game, but she does it by maintaining the child's attention into another activity. So she helps the child see what's coming next by bringing the new material in, offering a new choice, trying to make it really attractive. She does it first by showing, didn't work, she starts to make sounds, it works. The child reaches to it, there's a new choice. Get rid of the old material. The child reaches to the new activity. And now, so there's a new, that's the setup for the next activity. And what happens then will de determine a whole new activity with new learning goals. Um, so that's a four step joint activity and you see the power of it in maintaining that child's attention for five whole minutes, that's a five and a half minute activity. And I counted it, there's a new learning opportunity every 10 seconds in this little drumming routine. So 10, every 10 seconds for five minutes means that every minute has six opportunities times that there are 30 different learning trials inside this little activity in five minutes. That's a very rapid rate of learning. Um, you could not get more trials than this if you were doing a discrete trial or mass trial learning. And there are no breaks. You never have to lose the child's attention. So you can teach through all these activities um, without needing to give the child a break. That's another part of it. Uh, I think we, the, have a, we have a question, sure, a couple okay. of questions. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the question is, can this typical uh, ESDM be done with more than one child at a time and yes. be able to maintain the center of the child's attention. And the yes. other question is, what's the latest age uh, ESDM can be used? Okay, let me start with the second question first. ESDM is built for children who are five and under. Um, and it's built like, it, because this is the way young children play. This isn't typical play for a six-year-old or an eight-year-old or a 10-year-old. This is kind of baby play. And so the principles that we use and the materials that we use and the skills we're targeting are early childhood skills. For an older child, I, my personal idea is that once children pass five or six, we need to be teaching them what's age appropriate for them. 
I, I always feel like age appropriateness is critical. And even when there's a big gap between age and developmental level, a six-year-old child or an eight-year-old child is seen in his community or her community as an eight-year-old. And we want that eight-year-old interacting with eight-year-olds and doing eight-year-old things. And there are many, many eight-year-old things that an eight-year-old child with autism can learn to do, even if they have a slow learning rate, even if they have trouble communicating. So for me, I, um, I really think a lot about age. And I want to make sure that a child can do something and enter the interactions somehow with a child their own age. Why is that so important? It's important because they're going to be going to school with children that age. It's important because as you become a teenager, if you have a lot of learning needs and you need help, you need your peers to understand you and accept you and help you in the ways that you need help. When you're 25 and you're employed with other adults, we want that person in a setting with other adults who know how to support them doing things in an adult setting. And no matter how serious the level of impairment is, adults with disabilities can do many, many, many things that adults without disabilities can do. It's actually the school environment, which is the most difficult environment for people with disabilities um, to compete in because we're so focused on school activities. Once we get out of school, the way that adults spend their days, it's not working, it's not in general requiring our highest level of math skills, reading skills, physics, you know, daily work, daily recreation, daily skills at home, the things I do on a daily basis, most of the things I do, my eight-year-old step uh, granddaughter can also do too. She can cook, she can clean, uh, she can walk the dog, she plays, she can kayak, she does the sports I do, she can hike, she can play some cards with me, you know. Um, so I, I think this age appropriate, uh, it's, it's important to teach age appropriate skills to, to older children. However, many of these principles in terms of using materials, using activities that are appealing, joining people in them in a human way, making sure that there's fun interactions going on. Those are principles for life. Teaching people at the point where they learn now, uh, engaging in real human, pleasurable interactions with affection and attention. Those are qualities that we have as adults and that we can bring to teaching older people. So some of these principles will transfer, mm -hmm. um, but not the content and not some of the language skills. Uh, we come at language differently for older children. Okay. Um, so now let's go to the group, um, to the group discussion. And actually I can move ahead to that, sorry. Let me move ahead a little bit. So um, you may know that we have very solid outcome data from randomized controlled trials of this intervention. I just wanna show you this one slide. In the first randomized trial where we really just by chance either assign children to ESDM or to community treatment, we demonstrated, if you look on the left box, the orange line is children who got two years of ESDM at about 15 hours a week. And they're compared to the green line, children who got community intervention at about 15 hours a week. And you're seeing children's IQ scores. And what you see here um, this is kind of the closing of my story, is a 20-point gain from 60 to 80 in the children as a group with ESDM. That doesn't mean every single child, but it means as a group they gained 20 IQ points. That's the number of points that low VASA's kids gained. That's the mean IQ of low VASA's first trial was in the 80s. And so my thought from the low VASA paper that if this is possible, then I want to figure out a way to do it. This data showed me for the first time that we did figure out a way to do it. Um, and so that was kind of, it demonstrated two things I think that are important overall. First of all, the early uh, learning deficits of young children with autism are not necessarily because of intellectual disorders. 
The impairment itself makes it difficult for young children to learn. And if we can get the learning content in, then we can really help the child use what they have to learn from other people. The second point is that many different kinds of ways of teaching can create this kind of effect. And it, I don't think there's one best way to teach. I think ESDM is a good way to teach. I think the ways that the current day, the best of the discrete trial teaching people who are also using developmental principles teach, it's also a powerful way to teach. The answer to whether it's right for a child is in the data. Children who are being taught well progress well. They progress week by week and month by month. And for me, it doesn't matter what the name brand of the treatment is. I want to see the child's learning data. If the child is making progress in all their domains, and if they're catching up a little bit compared to their baseline, then they're making good progress in the treatment. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've shown that once children end ESDM and go off into community schools and mainstream schools, they maintain and continue to increase their uh, cognitive skills. So two years after this group of children uh, were studied and left our treatment, we followed them up again and we found that their mean IQ was now in the 90s rather than the 80s and that their symptoms of autism were much less severe than the comparison children's. So um, the changes that we were seeing in social interaction seem to have long-term effects. And a brain study that we did of these same children showed that after two years of treatment, these children now in that the same kind of looking paradigm, they now prefer looking at faces to looking at objects in exactly the same ways typically developing children do. And what this says to me is that the brain differences that first resulted in these children's lack of attention to people worked, that was improved by the treatment, that the effects that we're having are deep effects on brain function, not just surface behavior effects, but these kinds of differences in your young children's in, in treatment affect how the brain is actually wired and how the brain is working. Um, I think we'll skip on that. So I'm going to skip over this. We recently did a replication study in which we could replicate the effects with another large randomized controlled trial. This is the question to ESDM in groups. ESDM actually started as a group intervention. My preschool, we taught in groups, not one-on-one. -on -one. We didn't start one-on-one -on -one teaching till the study with Jerry Dawson. And so several of my colleagues have gone back, have taken ESDM as it is now and gone back to groups of young children. These two researchers, Cheryl Disanayaka is Sri Lankan, who lives in Australia and runs a wonderful research center in La Trobe University in Melbourne. And the gentleman below is an Italian, Giacomo Vivanti, who was my student, graduate student and postdoc student, and is now a fabulous autism researcher in Canada. But he worked with Cheryl and they were the first people to take the Early Start Denver model into a toddler daycare center, which also had money for autism treatment. And they set up an autism treatment center there and they taught children with ASD in very small groups in a toddler, uh, a typical toddler ratio, which in that country is like four or five to one. Now, they have big groups of toddlers, they had like 14 to 18 children in the classroom with three or four adults. And they have a very uh, rigorous kind of a British way of doing toddler school. But we trained all of the staff up in ESDM, and then we um, used the concepts to create joint activities uh, throughout the toddler's day. So everything the toddler did became joint activities, sitting at the tables for meal times, for the outdoor play routines, for the floor play routines, for the puzzle play routines. And they were working with a ratio of about 
I think it was one to three or one to four. In our preschool, our ratios were never more than one to three. That doesn't mean only three children in a room, but it means that if there are six children in a small group, there's an adult in the front interacting with them, an adult behind who's helping children participate. So that that's a ratio of one to three in a group of six children. So what we demonstrated here was basically very similar games. They use the same principles. There's a book, Giacomo wrote a book about how to do this in groups. It's published, it's available online. Um, and it's the same techniques, but now built around joint activities in toddler groups, in toddler daycare groups. Um, either groups for children with autism only or a toddler daycare setting in which one or two of the children have autism. Same principles, exactly the same principles, exactly the same fidelity tools, exactly the same way of writing children's treatment goals and working with them. But what the adult does with three children is move very quickly. So for instance, the scene you just saw with the little girl with the drum. In a, a toddler group, all the children would have drums. They'd be sitting around in a semicircle um, with the adult teach lead adult in front of them and a supporting adult behind them. They would each get a drum. They would probably hand the drum to each other. They'd be helped to hand the drums out, hand the, the uh, drumsticks out. The main adult would then demonstrate banging the drum. The children would be encouraged to imitate. The adult in front would be helping. The adult in back would be helping. Um, the adult would be demonstrating fast and slow, um, going from child to child. Can you drum? Can you drum fast? Can you drum slow? So they're kind of meeting each child where they are. Some children in a group will be right there with her, just like that little girl was. Other children will be right there at drumming, just drumming. And the adult moves quite quickly from one child, establish a routine, go back and forth, then to the next child, then to the next child, then back to the first child, so that um, each child has a chance to participate every minute. But, um, and each child is getting one-to-one -one work inside this little group, but the whole group is also drumming along. Can you kind of picture that? That's how that would look. All right, um, are there other questions? What time is it? The other question is, what do you, okay, two. Can ESDM be used for other pathologies such as Down syndrome or mental sure. delay? Sure, there's actually nothing autism specific about ESDM other than the focus on getting child attention mm -hmm. and, and motivating children to participate socially. The curriculum is a perfectly good developmental curriculum and the tools of imitation, demonstration, labeling actions, using children's preferred activities, that's all just good developmental um, preschool. As a matter of fact, for the people who aren't such believers in ESDM, when we first published the book, you might find a comment on Amazon. Somebody wrote in, there's nothing so special about this. This is just good early child education. And I'm like, thank you. That's a very high compliment for me. That's what I'm trying to do, is to provide good early childhood education that young children with autism can take in. Mm -hmm. But um, there's nothing about ESDM that, that can't be used in a mixed classroom, for instance, of young children, Down syndrome, slow learning, intellectual disability, language delay, autism, in a classroom of young children who have different kinds of disorder, this is a perfectly good curriculum for the whole classroom. It's all the children should progress well. You would write individual objectives for each child and you'd move them along at their own rate. Mm -hmm. um, other yeah. questions? Yes, uh, the next question is, you kind of addressed it a little bit. What if their interests are different in the group session? Like maybe, in, like in the drum example, what if another child in the group is not interested in the drum? Well, since drum is the activity, mm -hmm. the adult behind the um, other child would be helping that child drum. 
or they might have a choice. There might be two different drums. Mm -hmm. That child might be offered a bongo drum. Do they want to drum it with their hands as opposed to the stick? Or do they want two drumsticks instead of one? Mm -hmm. um, and if they don't want to do it at all, because it's an important skill to have, that child would be encouraged to drum. Mm -hmm. And then maybe as, as soon as that child drummed maybe 10 times, maybe their objective is the child will learn to hit a drumstick imitating another adult um, two times in a minute. If that child accomplished that with help and then by themselves, that might be all done. And they might then have free time in the back of the room because they've accomplished their activity. Or they might be given another thing that they like. Maybe they like to twiddle something mm -hmm. and if they've done their drumming, they passed their skill. You know, here's your, um, I don't know what, because it would, something visual or something soft. Here's your piece, here's your string. You can have your string right, good drumming. Here's your string. And he might be able to drum for, uh, to play with the string while the other children practice drumming. So it would still be taught. It's important skill to pick up. Imitating the adult is important. It would be helped to do it and then rewarded for the effort. And then given something else to do while the rest of the children finish. Okay. Okay. Um, maybe I know we're almost ending. I just, I think I want to say that when we co when we're coaching parents, mm -hmm. we coach exactly the same, coach them to do exactly what you've seen now. And we teach parents all the methods that we've just talked about. And for those of you who know that book that's written for parents, um, you should have seen everything you've already read in that little video. Mm -hmm. Because these are just basic techniques. This is, this is what parents do. If you watch a parent play with their two-year-old and just watch them for a few minutes, a parent who likes to play will show you all these techniques. Um, that's what makes it all work. And the reason that we're teaching children with autism in this way is because we want them to understand this language kind of, the language of play, the language of joint activity, because that's what everybody else does. That's what grandma will want to do. That's what auntie will do. That's what sister will do. And so once the child learns this framework, then they're ready to play with anybody else. And then they aren't going to look so different. They're ready to play. People aren't going to be saying, why won't he play? Because the child knows how to play. Or maybe you say, oh, auntie, he doesn't like that. Here, take these drums. He likes to play drums. And then auntie will have a way to play. And the child will have a way to relate to auntie. So by teaching these young children, their, their kind of age-appropriate social repertoire, that's what's embedded in all this, we're helping them become part of their community of two- and three-year-olds whom they will grow up with. And we will grow up the treatment and the materials and the activities as they grow up. Yeah, I have a, there's another question here. It's um, while using ESDM, do you use reinforcement like in ABA? If you reinforce, what is the difference between ESDM and ABA? Okay. So um, I want you to think a minute about that little girl drumming, and I want you to think about what the reward is for her. What is she working for? Where is the pleasure? Um, the pleasure for her is watching the adult drum, drumming herself. The reason she keeps going is because she is receiving reinforcement throughout that five minutes. That we are using the principles of ABA. The adult provides an antecedent, it's setting up the drum. The adult models the behavior that's desired, that's the B, and when the child, and the child responds, and the adult comments, smiles, yes, drumming, we're drumming, we're having fun, and the little girl's pleasure in the activity shows you she is receiving reward from the activity. This is entirely consistent, this is ABA teaching. But this is more than ABA teaching because this is also communication therapy. This is socially engaged teaching. This is building social skills. She's being rewarded for eye contact, for speech, for imitation, uh, for fine motor skills. So really, um, when you think about what a reward is, for little children, reward is not food. Um, unless it's mealtime. Reward is the pleasure of mama, the pleasure of mama's attention, the pleasure of sister tickling you, 
the pleasure of running around with your brother. Uh, the reward is in the activity and in the people. And what we're doing here is helping young children with autism experience social reward. And if they experience social reward, that's, that's the system we want them to be um, working towards because that's what gets you through school and in peers and everything else. Now, if the child was not at all interested in social reward, if the child was not interested in the drum and we needed to use this, we wanted this skill to develop because of its uh, functional activity for other children, then we might make a contingency that would be a different kind of reward. It might be that string I gave you an example of, of for a minute ago. If this child loves str his string more than anything else in the world, then it's like, okay, let's drum. Good job, you did your drumming. Here, you can have your string for a minute, no big deal. Have your string, set the timer, timer rings. May I have your string, please? Great, let's do this activity. So um, in ESTM, we have a hierarchy of rewards. Anything that motivates the child is useful. There's no nothing that's uh, um, never used, but we've, our highest preference is social reward or natural rewards from the material because those are the most those are available everywhere. The next uh, most positive reward would be praise, social praise. Then it would be another following another activity that the child prefers. So that's pre mac principle. Then it might be a token um, or a a, an object the child likes. If there's nothing else, sure. I have nothing against it. I use a token before I use food just because of the problems of feeding kids as rewards for everything. Uh, and we would bring in a token board and develop a token board very fast for a child who had no other reinforcement. But the token board then might be used for a break or something. So it's a hierarchy of rewards. This is spelled out very clearly in our manuals. Um, but there is reward going on all the time and you can see it in the child's response. That's why she keeps doing it. It's intrinsic reward for her. She loves this activity and that's the best kind. That's what keeps us doing things throughout our lives is when you find the intrinsic reward. Okay. And there is another question, a couple of them. So where is ESDN strong? In group setting or individual? And then another question is, do we have training workshops on ESDN for professionals in Africa? And how can we get access? Okay, um, first of all, it's... Okay. Um, Adelora, would you please... Um, thank you. Okay, so ESDN, we have tested it so far in groups, individually, and when parents administer the treatment. And we have demonstrated positive effects on child gains in all three situations. I think you choose the, we choose the modality, parent or group or individual, based on each child's situation. For some children, it's only going to come through parents and family. That's fine. We know how to do that. For some children, one-on-one -on -one teaching just doesn't occur. In their culture, everybody goes to school. I think that's true in the cities I've been in, in China, little children go to school early, also Australia. Um, so then the group becomes the right, the right, uh, the only real option. Um, in some situations, you know, there is, families work with it, children go to speech therapy and the speech therapist uses it. They go to daycare and the daycare people have learned. It's just a very flexible way of working with children that you, you can fit the basic principles into wherever the child is, as long as there's an adult who's willing to use the techniques when they're interacting with that child during their activities. Other questions? We're almost out of time. I can't believe it. Oh, Africa and online. Um, we, as I told you in the beginning, we are putting all of our workshops online. Um, the basic uh, ESDM course is already online. Any of you could access it. It's through the university. Uh, UC Davis comes up on the website. It's an online ESDM course. 
through UC Davis Continuing Education. We have so far not done, uh, we don't have any other online courses right now other than the one I told you, helpisinyourhands.org. But we are setting them up. And if Jane, if we wanted to set up one specifically for people in the African continent in that time zone, um, we could certainly do that. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for that. You're welcome. I'm also happy to meet up. You know this, Jane. I'm happy to meet with you with your groups and do this this way. Okay. In an informal way of helping and teaching. Awesome. Thank sure. you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Well, I want to go back to the gallery. Where's my gallery here? I want to see everybody. I'm going to stop sharing. There you are. Now I can see all your faces. Yeah. Um, I can also see the chat. I'm so happy to have been with you this morning. Thank you very much for inviting me. I hope this was helpful. And I hope for those of you with older children, you'll see that some of these ways of interacting mm -hmm. are things your older children probably enjoy as well. And that you can figure out how to do with a basketball or outside or with the games that they like to do with the materials they like. Mm -hmm. Even household tasks can be carried out in this kind of fun way, doing it together, imitating each other, uh, following up with something fun. This is how we teach kids to dress and feed themselves. And I hope this has given you some ways to think about, ways to motivate your children and ways for you to have fun with your kids as you're teaching them something, no matter how old they are. Um, wow, thank you. Thank you so much. That was amazing. We, I have learned a lot too. And, and uh, if we have uh, questions that are not here, I will, if you have any questions, just let me know. You can post them on our Facebook page a private page you can email me and i'll make make sure that i let dr rogers know and she and, can give us and, jane is, and you are also an expert dr jane and you can answer them <laughs> what i can't answer I, 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 I I with you. And, and why don't you why don't we have coffee together and we'll go over them together next week sounds fun to me sounds really good i'm so lucky to live in the same city as jane Wayward. I know. I'm so happy okay. to. Okay. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Thank so you thank so much. You. Today. We appreciate you. So thank happy you. to meet you all. Nice meeting. Take you. care. Bye, bye. Thank you. you take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank bye. you. Good night, bye. everyone. <laughs> bye, bye. You're so welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, goodbye, Dr. Jane. Good night. <laughs> goodbye, <you>. everybody. <laughs> I know. Usually people don't want to leave. <laughs> want to go to bed. <laughs> yeah. That is so good. At least we got some ideas. So if you think of another intervention program that you can start in your country, let us know. I'm, I'm okay. excited. Yeah, Thank possibilities you. are limitless. Yes, very. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so goodbye, everybody. <laughs> Good night. Thank you.
Thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you so much, Marilyn, for coming. That was awesome. I was so happy to be here. Yeah. yeah. So we, we have uh, to be, yeah, we need yeah. to. I think we still have a couple of people. I wonder if they forgot to, to log out. Okay. Techno, <laughs> Techno Spark for. <laughs> okay. Good, good night. I think she forgot, so I'm going to. Yeah, she's okay. Oh, okay. Oh, she left. I'm so happy. Thank oh, you wait. so much. Let me stop recording. Okay. Yeah.